Welcome to the Blackhawks Talk Podcast with Charlie Romeliotis and James Dubow on Pat Boyle. We're in the virtual podcast studio powered by PointsBet. Joining us on this podcast, Director of Amateur Scouting, Mike Donahue. Mike, how are you? Fantastic. Fantastic. So a week ago, uh, Charlie and I were on the set. James was in the uh, studio as well. And uh, we are focused on the lottery going absolutely berserk. You were... Uh, at the United Center with all of Hockey Ops and several Blackhawks employees and uh, special guests. What was it like for you when it was finally announced that Connor Bernard, or, or I'm sorry, the, the number one overall pick is coming to Chicago? <laughs> yes, let's stick with that. We have the number one pick. Uh, it was it was amazing. It was, um, you kind of doubt what you're hearing at the time, right? It was you know, our, our hockey ops group was on the second floor. Sorry, our scouting group was on the second floor of FanDuel uh, away from the hockey ops group. And our one directive was can't show any emotion whether you get one or you pick four or five, which up until then we were all, I don't know if it was, we were just talking ourselves into trying to pick four or five just to lessen it. But uh, it happened and I was right next to Daryl May, who was in our scouting group before and now he's uh, scouts the uh, players drafted by other teams for trade purposes but him and I have kind of the longest tenure with the Blackhawks so we were standing together watching that and the the, the cards are going and going and we're just kind of like oh my god is this happening is this happening and then you know we the, he flips the card for us and we just kind of ran out the door FanDuel and down the hallway and out of the United Center because we had a scheduled dinner to be at for that we usually kick off scouting meetings with so, and then all the other scouts got outside and we were just kind of walking around the United Center, like not knowing where to get our Uber or anything else. And <laughs> it was just like, oh my God, this just happened. So it was, it was good. It was a fun night. Obviously landing, winning the lottery is great, right? But to do it in a draft class like this, where there are so many high-end players at the top, I mean, what does that do for the organization when you can land a generational type player in a draft class like this? Well, it just it, it just gives you so many options because you know you're gonna, you know, and I and I've gone on record before saying, you know, you know, four or five of these kids could have been number one picks in a lot of years, uh, even in my tenure here, and even even going forward, maybe not next year, but you know, early indications are they could they would have been picks high, top number one picks in the in future drafts, um, but you know you're gonna get a good player, you know you're gonna hopefully get a foundational player where you can start to, you know, do a little bit of uh, roster management, um, roster creation over the next few drafts and trades and free agency. Um, so, you know, you've got that number one pick. You, you're hoping with a number one pick like that, you're going to get a, a real good play to build around. How different is this draft going to be for you guys from last year where you, there was some uncertainty of where or even if you were going to be picking in the first round? And this year, you know, you've got picks one and 19. Does that make your preparation process easier? Is it a little bit of peace of mind? How much uh, better does that make it knowing where you're going to be picking this year? Uh, it, it makes my job a hell of a lot easier. Um, like I said, last year was such a whirlwind between Kyle being named permanent GM, putting me in the position of director of amateur scouting with only seven weeks of hockey left us having as a group to know one through 24 yet as a 430 on draft day, we don't have any first round picks to as of the draft first round being over. And we've had three first round picks. Um, so the preparation has been easier um, just because we, we've known the ranges. We know even with the Tampa pick, the couple second round picks, like we knew, because the second round doesn't change, right? So we knew that whatever, uh, uh, regardless of the lottery, we were going to be picking 35th. Um, so you, you just get to the planning stages a little bit quicker. You also had the 19th overall selection along with the top pick. Uh, I assume that's higher than you you originally thought it was going to be. Um, as, as you take a look at that, how good a player do you think you could take in that range and it sounds like Kyle's open to possibly you know moving up in the first round because you do have draft currency. Well, I think one thing Kyle's shown the ability to do in, in such a short window is that he got us into the first round three times last year in a variety of different ways. Um, 
some people unhappy with some ways, others exuberant with the other ways. So Kyle's never going to stand pat on what we have. We do have the capital to do a variety of different things. Um, but like it's cliche as it is, right? You need two to dance, right? So it's it's also what other teams uh, want to do. And we have, I mean, fortunately this year, it's a, it's a very good draft for forwards. Um, some, some will be top six, some will be top nine, bottom six. Uh, we knew last year when, when we drafted Kevin Kochinski and Sam Renzel in the first round, knowing that this year wasn't a stellar year for defensemen, still some good ones, um, some of them that don't meet our criteria. So I, th I think Kyle's going to do as much as he can to get as high as he can with that second pick with 35, whatever he can do. We, we talk about how there maybe there are four or five players in this year's draft that maybe would have gone first overall last year. Does that make having the 19th overall pick as well make it more of like a mid to early, like, 12 to 14 range first round pick last year where you're going to be getting an, a, an impact type player in that range as well. Not just, you know, the generational talent out number one. Yeah, I, I think you're right with that. Like, I think the drafts could go any of a variety of different ways around eight or nine, depending on, because there are, you know, even though we might not be in the, in the defenseman market, there are some good defensemen available. Um, so depending, and the, I think there'll be a run of defensemen because, if you miss out on one, a team's going to be like, oh, we, I got to get the next one. Uh, and they don't want to lose. So what's going to happen is, is guys are going to get bounced down the list a little bit. Um, and historically, year after year, there's guys that fall in the draft for whatever reason it may be. So even at 19, whether Kyle's able to move up or move back, I'm pretty confident we're going to get a, a good player with a high ceiling. Historically, the team's been able to find some really strong players in that kind of like second, third round range. How would you characterize the kind of depth of this year's draft class, the importance of you guys having so many picks in that range, where even if you miss out on players in the first round, you can still fill needs in those second and third rounds? Well, I, I think it's a luxury that it lets you take a chance because you have so many picks, you know, especially we have four in the second round right now. The luxury is you can take a chance on a guy that you don't think you maybe get later because you already got some in the stable. Uh, and you heard me say that about Sam Renzel last year. Um, the luxury we already had Kevin Kochinski and Frank Nazar drafted. So we could take a, we weren't picking again until 37. We didn't think Sam was going to be available anywhere from the, the stuff we were getting was anywhere from 20 to, to probably 30. He was going to be off the board. So when he's sitting there and, and teams are calling Kyle and, you know, there's that value there. You take them maybe then a little, a little higher than some, some pundits might, a media might've had them. Uh, and that's going to be the same thing with the second round this year. You can, you know, once you get to that, those fifties, I think we got two picks in the fifties that you can take a chance on some, you can take a, we call it taking a swing at guys um, on some guys, maybe a little bit later because you want to ensure that you have, I've got a mechanics question about the, how the draft process works. You know, when when people watch the NFL draft, they see that everybody uh, is huddled in a draft war room at the team's facility and they call the pick in. NHL much different. You guys are all on the floor of the draft around a table. Uh, what is the communication like amongst hockey ops during the draft are you guys on headsets are, are are you are you on a text chain dming when you're when you're trying to discuss possible trades moving down moving up how, how take us through that part of the, the mechanics well there's there's actually less discussion than you would think amongst the group as a whole once you get to the table uh we like to think the the whole information process and and the list and everything is done by the time we sit down um, so there's not a lot of communication, you know, the way the tables are set up rectangularly, you know, we have all of our crossover scouts and our regional scouts down there, uh, as well as ownership, Luke Richardson. And a lot of people want to be on the draft table on night one, but not the whole day of day two. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but, but down the one end, at least for last year, and I'm sure it'll work the same way this year you had, uh, at the, we'll call it the head of the table facing the stage, uh, Jeff Greenberg to my left myself, Kyle, and then Norm MacIver, you know, so as, as the year progresses, just to step back a little bit, the year 
you know, we got informational gatherers in the scouts and they funnel the information up to the crossover scouts and myself. And then ultimately it ends up being myself and the, our leadership group that make the decision. So when we're down at the end of the table on the draft, we've kind of, we know where the pockets are. We know where the groupings are. So now it's just a waiting game on, on who's taking who. Then when you get into the, you know, maybe the third round, there starts being more conversation where you might call one of the regional scouts over. Hey, we got these two guys in your area coming up next. You know, what's your preference? Um, but the, it's a little bit the 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 draft itself is a little bit archaic. Like I think we're the only ones who do it that way. Um, what I found out during the two COVID drafts, because we did it from fifth third at the time, um, there was more communication because. You know, at the time, Stan was the GM. He could get up and walk around, um, you know, to talk to other drafts or take a phone call. Like, there's really no room for movement right. uh, when you're down at the draft. So, it's you know, you, you know, it's primarily when it gets to that night, it's it's the four of us down the one end. And Soupy's over on the corner. He, he helps out quite a bit as well. So the dialogue's usually down that end. You, you say kind of archaic, and I know what you mean, but, like, could you see this evolving a little bit where, you know, the NHL takes a page from some of the other leagues and says, okay, we're going to pull back from being on the floor. You're going to, you know, be in your own uh, draft headquarters so that you can have more of this dialogue. Yeah, I, I, I think from a, a staff standpoint, that's would be ideal. That would be the best. But I think what the NHL is looking at is, is their fear is kind of like what happened with the NFL this year with Will Evans. Like they had, they bring in 40 guys that they think are going to go in the first round to one area and we're in another area. And all of a sudden 10 guys are sitting there that haven't got called. Um, whereas at least when it's in an arena and all the teams are there, these it's an event for these kids and their families. So the majority of them uh, will be on site. Um, so the NA, it's just one less thing the NHL has to worry about. So I think logistically that works better for the NHL. One of my favorite parts about being at the draft is when like a general manager gets up <laughs> like, Oh, Kyle Dubas is getting up where who's he going to talk to? And he's like, Oh, he's just going to the bathroom and it's like false alarm. Right. Um, so that, that part, I appreciate it as uh, you know, it's just fun to kind of look at as far as, well, the other thing you don't see, hold on. The other thing you don't see is we all have uh, you know, we all have those, uh, those plugged in phones from the seventies and eighties on the yeah. table with our logo on it. And, you know, it's funny, all the scouts are on the table to, and, and it automatically pops up when the phone rings, what team is calling. Um, and there's one phone at each end, so all, everybody can see who's calling. And it's just like they they look and they're like, oh, what do we got going? Like it's – they love this. cooking. Right? They, they want <laughs> so it's, it, it. It does get funny down there. Huddle up because it's time to feel the power with points bet. Points bet is giving better 60 days of bonus bets now through the end of May as part of points bets power hour. Check the app every day for when your bonus bet is dropping and use it on an, an insane game parlay. Download the points bet app today using the code SHYTALK10 and unleash the power of winning. Points bet, your move. So we, we talk about landing a, a generational type talent in this year's draft. It feels like the hardest part about a full scale rebuild is getting that foundational piece, right? How, how much does your job I don't want to say get easier, but knowing that, okay, we check, we're going to check that box off. Now, how do we kind of fill around the edges and make sure we're adding to, to the prospect pipeline? Well, just to cut you off a little bit, I think the, sure. the foundational piece is huge, but also the patience level. Um, yep. mm. Cause we are drafting 17 year old kids and, and it's not, it, it varies from the NFL and the NBA where they're getting day one starters um, right when you pick them. And for us, it's a little bit longer of a process, most times taking three to five years. But we always want to kind of form an opinion on these guys six months, nine months after the draft. Um, but that being said, you, you, you know, you look back at a lot of teams that have, have won cups and been successful teams is, I call them the big fish, right? Like you've got a big fish. Like, so knowing that we're going to get one at one, uh, it allows you to look at not so much uh, look at things differently the way you do things, not so much at the drafts because we're kind of just sticking with, with traits like skating, speed, uh, IQ, competitiveness. And if, if we get as many players as we can that meet that criteria, um, it allows Kyle and, and Norm and Soupy and Jeff to do different things where, you know, if you look at them as assets, 
then maybe they're not going to play for you, but maybe a couple of them help you get something else down the road. So as long as we stick to the traits along with getting the big fish, um, it helps out dramatically. You mentioned in your uh, last uh, statement there the importance of remembering that these are 17-year-old kids and that you're having to be patient with them. And I was curious to you about to ask you about the importance of meeting these prospects face-to-face, whether it's at the combine or ultimately at the draft itself, because evaluating just off of tape is great and you can tell a lot about the way a player plays the game. But with the culture that you guys are trying to install, kind of getting to know them as people is going to be critical too. How important is that to your skill? scouting process to be able to actually talk to these guys and lead up to the draft, just so you get a better sense of the kind of guys that you're bringing into the organization. I, I think knowing these players off the ice and their families off the ice is it, it probably the most important part because we all see the on ice product. Like there's no debating whether a guy can skate or he can't skate or he's competitive or he's non-competitive. But if you don't know these guys off the ice and I think, I'm going to toot the scouts' horns tr- tremendously here because they do, they do an unreal job at it. Like we had one one guy this year, and I won't give you the name, but he, he's going to be a first round pick. Um, who his initial interview in person wasn't great with our area scout, um, and he sat on the information and, and he's done it before. And then he he drove down and met with the player and his family uh, for dinner, and the parents were divorced. So you can imagine what that was like. Um, And he sits with this player who he really wasn't wacky about to begin with, just to dive into the dynamics of the player and maybe what's going on behind the scene on on why he does things a certain way and um, how the culture is at home. So I think our scouts don't leave any stone unturned. Like it's the information that they get. And we try to stay away from coaches, right? Because coaches are kind of, and I I know it's, but they're like here, right? Like they're looking right in front of them where – you know, you talk to athletic trainers, you talk to um, uh, teachers, you talk to security guys around the rink. Like they, they'll talk to anybody to get information about a player. And ultimately, when we get to the combine, we already have that information. So for me, uh, it's more of I can now go off of that information and guide a conversation one way or another based on if I need more information uh, or I'm happy with the information we already have. I've heard Kyle say that, you know, the average draft produces one NHL impactful player per team, Mm -hmm. give or take. Yep. But with the amount of picks you have and where they are, uh, do you feel the pressure to have a a high hit rate, uh, say beyond the one, looking at maybe two or possibly three in this draft? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, our goal is a staff, and I know it's unrealistic, but our goal is to hit on everyone, right? Don't, don't you can't tell the regional guys that they're not going to hit on a guy because they're going to tell you you're wrong. Um, what I think Kyle's trying to do, or what I know he's trying to do, he's just trying to increase our odds. So, I mean, let's face it: the majority of players in the league come out of the top three rounds. The majority of those players come in the in the top round. So. What Kyle's done with with the draft capital is put ourselves in a in a driver's position to to do certain things and get as high as we can to try to get to where the best players are. So I think that's what we're trying to do. That, that's an underrated part about having a, a bunch of picks like in our minds or in fans minds. They think having a lot of picks allows you to move up in the draft to go get a player that you like. But having a quantity having the amount also increases your hit rate of maybe, you know, of, of landing an impact type player in those later rounds. Right. Yeah. Like I forget what, what general manager said a few years ago, he said the only way to hit on more is if you have more. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, it's simple math. So um, do I think we'll make all 11 picks this year? Cause what did we have last year? We had 11, two or 10. Um, uh, I think it was 10, 10. And then right. we got 11. Like at some point you have too many picks because although we don't think, Although we think we're going to hit on everybody, I mean, you can't, right? Like if this, if you hit on 25 guys, like it just, it throws everything off with, with contracts and development and who's coming on the scene and everything else. So um, I think he's doing the best he can to kind of move things around a little bit. Hey, speaking of that 2022 draft class, how much did you follow a lot of the, the progressions, Korchinski's, Ryan Green's, and how encouraged are you with the, the development of those players? It honestly didn't feel like any of them 
took a step back. They all took steps forwards outside of maybe Frank Nazar, who had his injury, obviously. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, unfortunately for Frank and even Paul Ludwinski, they, they had injury-riddled years, uh, ridden years, rather. Um, but I, being my first draft that I was at the head of the table, I, you know, I was on the apps more than any, uh, trying to look at scores and, um, you know, seeing who's getting points. And un unfortunately we, we equate development with points on how they're doing, but some guys are drafted that they're not all going to be point getters, right. They're going to fill specific right. roles. And, you know, I, I remember watching, uh, the score, like the Gatineau game and, and Savoy, had like zeros across the board and then you got to the last column and it's, which is hits and it was seven. Right. <laughs> so that, that's Sam's game, right? Like if Sam's got two and two and then it's zeros the rest of the way, that's not what Sam's going to be in the NHL. Right. So it's, but if you're just looking at it from a point perspective, it can kind of skew things a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I remember like I, I read something about, uh, you know, Sam Renzel being in Waterloo, and not many players go to the USHL after being picked in the first round. Well, if, if people knew the whole thing behind it, Sam Renzel was drafted in 11th grade. He wasn't eligible for college. So Sam had a place somewhere last year. Uh, Minnesota tried to get him in late with through summer credits to get into Minnesota to join their, their team for a national championship run. It's just the amount of credits and the work that Sam would have had to do wasn't feasible. So you need somewhere to play. So – you know, he, 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 he got punished a little bit because he went to, back to the USHL. Well, that was kind of the only option. Like he, there was nowhere – he wasn't going to go play in the CHL. So, you know, but from a from – a, they all had really good plus one years. Um, again, now it's seeing them, you know, what's the next step they're going to do, right? Like you see these guys in college like the, the Greens, Renzel going in, Nazar, Aiden Thompson. Traditionally, the, the biggest summer – of development is between your, the end of your freshman year and your sophomore year, because now you're in with a team and you're training, you know, nutrition you, and you know, everything um, versus just working out at the local YMCA or whatever. And so it kind of, I'm looking for these guys to take even more of a jump next year. And the, the development of these players, as you alluded to, having the different skill sets, it really kind of gives you an idea of where the organization needs to spend its assets. How nice is that to have that flexibility with the number of draft picks that you have, but also to have the guys currently in your system that fill specific needs. And then you can use these picks to go kind of acquire different assets who uh, maybe fill uh, different requirements for the team. Well, I, I think it's great. I mean, I think we're dealing from a, a strong point with uh, our defenseman prospect pool. Uh, and I include Vlasic and Kaiser in that because they're still so young. But our, I would put our pro defenseman prospect pool up against anybody in the NHL. Uh, I think that we have some high end in it. We have some depth in it. Um, so I, I, I think that allows us, like I said earlier, to maybe look over a defenseman and go get a forward that we want to get in the draft because we know already what's there. Uh, you know, so I, I think knowing – the prospect pool that we have, we can target certain areas uh, based on need. Mike, how many goalies, if any, do you have with a first round grade? Zero. Wow. Zero. Yeah, this is a, it's a good goalie year. Um, I don't want to say it's great because goalie, like you, you hear everybody say goalies are a little bit funky. Um, you know, one, one of the top goalies, Adam Gajan, Guy in, if you will, who played for Slovakia at the Worlds, World U, I mean the World Championship Juniors, rather. We all saw on the show he put on against Canada, so on and so forth. Well, you know, everybody in the building, all the GMs was like, we should have fired our Slovakian scout last year because he went through a draft, right? Like, so you could have got him in the seventh round last year, and then this year you're going to have to take him in the second round. Um, but that's what's the weird thing about goalies. Like he wasn't on anyone's radar last year. And then he, you know, he grows into his body at, from 17 to 18. Um, and goalies just generally take a lot longer to develop. And, and the position we had, we had good meetings last week and Dan Ellis who played in the league, who works for us, he kind of heads up our goalie scouting part. I played it. Daryl may played it, but Dan Ellis played it in the league. Right. So he kind of, he heads it up. He does an awesome job. 
But he said the position's changing. You don't have the the Patrick Waz, the Martin Brodeurs, who are playing 60, 70 games a year. So when you talk about is there a true number one, there's not 32 number one goalies in the NHL because mm -hmm. they don't, you know, maybe, I don't know, I'd have to look on what Vasilevsky played this year, but 50 maybe. And then because nobody plays back-to-back -back anymore um, and knowing the schedule so far in advance, you can kind of set your own internal schedule for goalies. So there's, you know, I thought Dan made a great point is there's a lot of, we call them 1A, 1B goalies. Um, but this year, and I don't even know last year, like is, is I don't know if there's any more true number one goalies. They're gonna, are just going to play 60 and then go on a playoff run. Right. Or there aren't many true number one goalies that you would pay a lot of money to because you know right. exactly what you're getting with that goalie. Right. Um, right. Last one for me, Mike, we talk about after this draft class or after this draft, you're, you guys are probably going to have one of the best pipe pipelines in the NHL. But then you look at 2024 and you're going to have two first round picks and you're going to have six within the first three rounds. You have two more first round picks in 2025. Like, are your eyes lighting up at like, man, we're going to have a really loaded farm system you know, in the next coming years. And we're basically going to have so many options on who we want to be part of this Blackhawks next core or, or just the pieces around them. Yeah. Like I, I think our prospect pool, according to, to some media outlets, like jump from mid twenties to top five, if, if you will, like the, I think Scott Wheeler and the athletic, um, which honestly was, was a surprise to me. I, I knew we, at least off our, you know, I knew we had a good draft last year. Prior to that, I knew like uh, Reichel and Camesso and Kaiser and even Del Mastro and, and Allen and Doc. And I knew they were good players. I didn't know how they were looked at by the outside world. Um, we're for sure having a number one overall pick this year. I'm, I'm anticipating we'll probably go in the top three. Um, but again, that's <laughs> as much as I love the passion that those guys do, that's not why I'm doing this. Like I'm trying to, get as many good players with our amateur group that as I can, because then I know it gives Kyle uh, the opportunity to do different things on his end, whether it's, you know, moving one of the future first round picks to enhance a pick this year, I'll get a player to go in that top six. Um, so it, it just, if, if we, we have the capital over this year and then following two drafts to go in a lot of different ways. Uh, so it really is a nice luxury to have. This isn't going to be a shock to you when I say this, but we really are in kind of this new era of Blackhawks hockey where longtime fixtures of the franchise have moved on and, you know, the slate is pretty well cleaned. Does that excite you? Does that play into your thinking at all that you're putting the stamp on a new era of the Blackhawks? Is that something you look forward to with drafts like these? You know, it, it really does. Like it, it, you know, it could sound corny a little bit, but I was, I was part of the staffs on the three cups in, in 10, 13 and 15, but 10 was, my first year as a part-time scout in New England, that was Char uh, Charlie Coyle, Kevin Hayes draft, and then I went full-time. And it's kind of I, – I, basically, I was just along for the ride, right? Like, it's just – you know, I was part of the drafts when with Saad and uh, Andrew Shaw and those guys that, that made an impact. But this, like I said, as corny as it sounds, like we have this, this blank canvas to, to build this. And it's no secret, the majority of it's going to be built through the draft. Um, and we, we'll win again. Like, I don't I don't question that. Like, it's – I don't even think it's naive. We just – I believe in the group we have and the players that we'll get that the next one will mean a ton just because I was on the grassroots level of it. Playoff hockey always reminds us how different the regular season is from the postseason. And the player that, you know, has an edge to their game – uh, has that compete level, the willingness to go to the tough areas, you know, kind of rises to the top there. And you're like, okay, that's that's why that team is moving on. And we've even seen it from the players that uh, Kyle has brought in uh, via free agency, uh, signing, the, you know, grabbing a Sam Lafferty who was in the minors with Pittsburgh. And now we've seen him, you know, elevate his game uh, with Toronto. Um is that a tough trait to evaluate uh, when you're looking at a player, say, in a regular season college game or what have you, and the intensity may not be at a high level in that game? It, it, or does it stand out? If a player has that willingness, it doesn't matter if they're playing Bowling Green on a Friday night, you're going to see it. 
Yeah, I think along with the competitiveness is it, there's a lot of guys that are really competitive um, and play really hard. But one one trait that we won't get away from is skating. Right. So if you look at Sam Lafferty, the way he skates and, you know, it's just he creates so much havoc on the ice. It, it is a luxury that he has got an ultra competitive bone in him. Um but the, the number one trait for our group is skating, skating, skating. And we've taken players off of the board, whether it be college free agents, CHL free agents, or even for the draft, that if you can't skate, then you're not going to be a Blackhawk. Like it's just, you know, we like to think that they're all competitive because of the, the nature that they play and the level they're going to play at. Um, but we won't get away from skating. Um and the, like you said, the competitiveness could wane from night to night, depending. We see it a lot in the CHL because they play 70-something games. Like a, a Tuesday night in January, it's just not everybody. Should, it's kind of like the NHL, right? It's just you're like, huh, we were just there last night, but we didn't. We weren't really a competitive team. Um, so I, th- I think that it's one of our traits, competitiveness, but the, the skating aspect has to be there too. And that's why, it, like you just said, Pat, I mean – Colin Frazier says it best. You you need two teams in the NHL. You need one for 82 games, and then you need one to win 16. And no better player to know it than him. He won three cups, like one with us and two with LA. It's just, it's it's. We can say it's not different hockey, but it's different hockey. Mike, thank you for your time. I know you put in a tremendous amount of work uh, during the season, and we look to see that uh, payoff in late June when we gather in Nashville. Awesome. Anytime, guys. You know, I like I like talking hockey. So, see you on Broadway. All right. No, you, you won't see me on Broadway. <laughs> Friday night after. No, Friday night after, I'll be packing. I got a family trip on the first. So, <laughs> there you go. All yeah. the best, Mike. And that's right, my new edition it. of the Blackhawks Talk Podcast.